Namaste. Welcome, everyone. We are ready to begin our program for tonight. Are you all excited to hear from our great lineup of speakers today? I know I am. Uh, I am Dr. Lavanya Vemsani, Professor of History at Shani State University in Ohio, USA. Since this is an event for scholars, uh, we will start it with a hymn to invoke Goddess Saraswati, the goddess of learning and knowledge. Saraswati Namastubhyam Varade Kamarupini Vidyarambham Karishyami Siddhir Bhavatu Me Sada. At the outset, I would like to note that this meeting is being recorded and will be shared on social media platforms. The first part of this event will feature each of our panelists uh, to speak about their journey. And the second part will be a panel discussion where the participants will be able to ask questions. You might be wondering, what is Bharatiyam? Well, let me introduce you to President <laughs> of Bharatiyam, <laughs> Professor Yogesh Rati. Who can tell you more about Bharatiyam? Uh, Professor Rati? Yes, um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Vimsani. Uh, Professor Ra Yogesh Rati, I didn't give you your introduction. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, Professor Yogesh Rati is an associate professor at the Harvard Medical School. His background is in electrical engineering but his research is focused on neuroscience with the objective of understanding the structure and function of the brain. He is the recipient of several multi-million dollar NIH grants awarded and is a leader in the field of brain imaging. I invite Dr. Yogesh Rati now to tell us about Bharatiya. Professor Rati. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Vamsani. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, um, and uh, I would like to uh, welcome all the distinguished faculty on the panel today. Also, the incredible faculty and researchers and students who are here to hear them all across the U.S. and India. Um, ideally, it would have been great to have this session where we could in person felicitate our panelists for receiving the Padma Awards, uh, which, are, which by itself is definitely an incredible achievement. Uh, but given the current, current situation, uh, I would at least like to uh, ask everyone who's, who's present here to join me uh, and on behalf of the Bhartiyam team to virtually la laud and uh, applaud all the achievements of all our panelists. Uh, I know that this is virtual, so at least we'll do the virtual applaud and um, for their achievements. We are all greatly honored uh, that uh, you know you are here among us and uh, to, to really guide us here today. Um, as you know, very few such events take place uh, you know, for, for the Indian American faculty across disciplines uh, where they can come together on a single platform. And this indeed is uh, one of the objectives of Bhartiyam. Indians who have immigrated to the United States have achieved great feats, uh, incredible feats. And you all who are attending here are a testimony to this fact. Uh, but these achievements are not limited to uh, some of the things that we typically associate, uh, you know, folks with, uh, with the CEOs uh, of global companies, but also in the field of academia where, uh, I feel that not much uh, is known to the society around us and that uh, there is less of an appreciation of the academia uh, today. But uh, we want to, we thought about this and we thought that there should be a platform where we could have all the scholars uh, of Indian origin who could come together on a single platform and, and uh, we, where we could celebrate uh, our, our achievements as well as uh, know each other and network with each other. And, and, and this brings me to the topic of uh, the mission and vision of Bhartiyam, uh, which is why we started it in the first place. So as you know, our diaspora is, is, is big. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing ones, as well as one of the richest ones and the most educated one. 
uh, individually, I, uh, you know, we would all agree that uh, we have achieved uh, great things. Each one and each one and every one of us have achieved great things. But uh, as a community, we could achieve even greater heights. It would have a multiplier effect, not an additive effect, if we could come together and contribute both to, the, to India and the United States. Next. And so Bhartiyam, about Bhartiyam very quickly, uh, it's a socio-cultural platform for Indian students, industry professionals, and scholars in the United States. Uh, we work with a vision where uh, we provide a platform to the Indian youth and empower them with strong cultural foundation so that we can work collectively to uh, aspire to, to achieve uh, personal growth as well as the global aspiration of uh, the Indian American community uh, by promoting the four C's, which we call the four C's, which is culture, uh, which basically is celebrating the diverse Indian culture. We all know and recognize that. And uh, career provide a networking opportunity as well as mentorship to, uh, to, to all the students for career growth, uh, contribute to the progress of United States and the US, is country and the community connect with the local community groups and and help them in whichever way possible so these are the four c's that drive Bhartiyam. next and these this is a very small sampling of the activities that Bhartiyam does uh, we do scholar we have uh, three councils scholars students and professional councils and uh, as you can see the scholars council this is one of the type of programs we organize we hope to organize many such programs in the future too where we connect faculty uh, from all different areas and, and scholars as well. The Students' Council is also very multidimensional with uh, activities like AWAS to share, uh, which is a forum to share and discuss ideas among students. Geek Talk, uh, as well as to connect, uh, the aim is to connect with Indian student organizations across the different universities. And then there is the Professional Council, which really focuses on events related to young professionals. And next. Uh, so I would say that uh, anyone who's uh, really interested, uh, please uh, you know, have time, please do uh, send us an email, drop us a line uh, and uh, to volunteer at Bhartiyam. And with that, I will hand over uh, the podium to Professor Vemsani for, for the next part. Thank you, Dr. Rati, for that introduction to Bharatiyam. I will now move on to introducing our panelists and hearing about their journey and how the Indian value system has helped them to get where they are today. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Nanda. Uh, Professor Ved Nanda is the John Avon Distinguished University Professor and the Thompson G. Mars Professor of Law at the University of Denver Law Center and Director of Vednanda Law Center. He has been recognized across the world and has won numerous awards, including the Padma Bhushan from the Government of India. Professor Nanda's work in the classroom, as well as international justice, has earned him a number of followers, including Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State. It would fill a book if I just list his awards and accomplishments in international law. I would now like to invite Professor Nanda to share his thoughts with us about how the Indian value system has helped him reach such great heights. Professor Nanda. Professor Nanda, I invite you to speak. Yeah, we need to unmute. Thank you very much, Professor Ramsani, Professor Rati for arranging this program. And uh, before we began here, I had the privilege of um, seeing and talking with uh, the awardees and my Sadhana Namaskar to everyone. I had known about their accomplishments, but this is the first time that I had the opportunity to see many of them. And I was delighted that uh, Bhartiyam brought all of us together. Um, you have asked to talk about uh, the journey to Padma Award, Padma Bhushan. Um, journey is to a destination. Nobody, none of us had taken the journey 
to reach the destination of Padma Awards. In my case, I think I probably others were in the same setting. I was in Delhi. I'm the honorary professor in Delhi. And I was giving lectures there. And at night, about midnight, I had uh, Vijay Chauthai Walaji, he's one of the leaders in India, called me and he congratulated me. And I was worried about it. I said, you know, what, what is happening? Congratulations for what? And then I thought about it just a couple months before that. The American Bar Association had given me their highest international law award. And I said, uh, Vijay Chauthaiwala, he's not in the United States. The award was not that very widely publicized. How does he know it? So I didn't say anything. I just simply said, thank you very much. I didn't know what he was telling me about. And then about 10 minutes later, another call came. And then they told me that uh, this is what the government of India had done. Uh, but uh, I didn't know anything about it. I think I had been away from Denver. I don't know if they tried to reach me in Denver, but I had no idea about uh, that destination. But you have asked me about the question about Indian uh, values and uh, that system and how it helped. Um, I think here I need to talk about the journey. I'm born in part of Punjab that's now in Pakistan, came to Delhi, formative years in Delhi. And in Delhi, I was very fortunate after MA and in my law, I got a first class first and um, that was um, um, gold medal and all that. But then um, my university gave me lecturership at the University of Delhi. And one of my professors had come back from the United States. So uh, to fast forward, he asked me to apply. I applied to the University of Chicago and Northwestern. Those are mm -hmm. the two places that they had gone. I came to the University of Chicago, uh, but the person I came to work with was going to Germany. And he said, we are going to Germany. And I, I didn't know who we were. And I said, you know, I came here to work with you. And he said, no, I have arranged everything. We'll go to Germany. You be with me for a year. And at that time, I decided that I did not really want to go to Germany. I had no language proficiency. And to be there for a year, I had come to work here and then to go back. So I went to Northwestern because Northwestern had accepted me. And the professor who had accepted me, he looked at me and said, you rejected us, but I'm going to accept you. In any event, from there, I went to Yale and from there, the United Nations. And then I came to the University of Denver. And here for about 14 years, I was the vice provost, vice chancellor of the university. And after uh, doing a service in the administration, I, I'm a teacher, I'm a uh, student. I just wanted to go back to the law school and I have been there and the university has been very kind to me. But the point simply is that Indian values, they are the ones at the heart, my heart. And from the very beginning, that is where my family, it was a very spiritual family going to temple, but also reading spiritual books. And, and from there, I had uh, organizations that I worked with. I worked with a Sangh, and uh, those values had become part of my life. And when I came to this country, I decided that there was absolutely no way that I was going to compromise on principles. So all my life, it has been the same setting. I have been very fortunate with the American Society of International Law, World Jewish Association. I was international president, 145 countries. And um, it is the same setting with the uh, International Law Institute, Law Association. Um, and I have been very fortunate with working with all these uh, um, organizations in my own field, 
And I have had the privilege of having about 25 books, about 250 major chapters and law reviews, and having taught in this country in about 10 places on visiting chairs and all over the world, from France to England to Ireland. And uh, for many years, starting in The Hague, Brussels, Luxembourg, Strasbourg, Salzburg, Vienna, and Oxford. So have had wonderful time, but Indian lifestyle, Indian values, they have been part of me. And now I am a uh, um, board of trustees of a university here. And uh, in my university, I was on the board of trustees as a faculty member. And at my university in 160 years, the very first time they have given to a faculty member their right. award, the Founders Award. And uh, I have been privileged to have that. So I'm delighted that you had all brought all of us together. So not to found it, this uh, a destination, but that has been a journey. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nanda. That was an amazing and inspiring journey. We look forward to hearing more from you about um, your experiences and uh, achievements uh, during the panel discussion. Let's now introduce you to our next speaker, Professor Ratan Lal. Professor Ratan Lal uh, is Distinguished University Professor of Soil Science and Director of Carbon Management and Sequestration Center at Ohio State University. He has appointments in universities across the globe, from USA to Costa Rica to Nigeria to India. He is truly a global leader. Professor Lal works at the Center for Climate Change and Conservation Science, the two aspects that define our life in the 21st century. Professor Lal has dedicated his life to the service of our Mother Earth, the Budevi. He has received numerous awards and it will take me another half hour to just enumerate <laughs> his awards list. However, I would just mention that he received Padma Shri in 2021. I would now like to ask him to share with us how the Indian value system has helped him uh, chart the difficult path as a global leader in social and agricultural science, soil and agricultural science, sorry. Uh, Professor Lal, I would request you to speak. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ramsani. It's an honor to listen to Dr. Ved Nanda. Uh, I am really humbled uh, what he just mentioned about himself. We have something in common. I also come from Gujaramwala and um, my family uh, was a farmer's family. And uh, they had nine acre of land just outside of Gujaramwala. And then after partition, they came and settled outside of Karnal. And I was told um, that uh, my father met with Patwaris and other, and they said, your land in Gujaramwala was very poor quality. The land we are giving you here is very good quality. Therefore you get only one and a half acre. So I grew up on that one and a half acre and he used to rent uh, another three, four, five acres of land. So I have seen uh, the circumstances of how the smallholder people are and how they live. Uh, I graduated from uh, the school in the village, which was a primary school when I joined. And fortunately <clears throat> it became middle school and high school. And, we were three brothers and sister, and I was the only one who went to school. The others were older than me when the partition happened, and they kind of got lost, uh, did not get a chance to study. And uh, when I graduated, uh, my bhuva, my father's sister, used to live in Ludhiana. So she asked me to come here, and we will help you look for a job. And uh, our neighbor was a, a peon to the principal of the Government Agriculture College at Ludhiana. <laughs> and he told me that, uh, I don't know whether you can find a job or not, but you should come and see this college because it is being developed by Ohio State University. So I went to that uh, place and I saw the principal, I saw a few American professor. I told him I want to join this college. 
So I filled in the application form and to my bad luck, I was rejected. I was rejected because uh, I don't think they thought that I was dressed properly to be a college student. I had Jutti and I had Bodhi and I had uh, <laughs> <laughs> hair and Pantadar Pajama and uh, everything. And um, I was told you are not admitted. So somehow the same PN, he talked to the principal and principal said, you have to really go to the Minister of Agriculture because the all seats are filled. And eventually this to cut story short, I did meet the Minister of Agriculture. His name was Gyanis Kartar Singh Ji. And uh, he told me Pratap Singh Kairo has to give the permission because all seats are full. So, and I told him I, you know, best in my school village. And uh, so eventually I got admission about two months after the classes began. And I was told by Gyanis Kartar Singh and uh, Sardar Pratap Singh, that if you are as good as you think you are, then uh, at the prize distribution, we will be there. And of course, I was so fortunate that I had prizes in every subject. And uh, the reason for prizing was not that I was so worried about being first. Uh, it was two reasons. One was 12 rupees a scholarship was given if you can get a certificate, you are a refugee. Another was that mm. eight rupees would be given if you are in the top five students. And I had to have that 20 rupees and I got it. And uh, that was the start of the journey. And uh, then in my last year, everybody was studying genetics and plant breeding and so forth because Dr. Swaminathan at that time was a big thing yeah. and uh, everybody wants to study. So a professor from Ohio State who had just come back after PhD, his name was Devraj Bumbla. He was originally from Lyalpur Agriculture College and now at Ludhiana and he called me and he said, look, uh, don't go to botany and genetics, study soil science. And I said, why should I study soil science? He said, because I think I can send you to Ohio State. And he was true to his words. I was the first student in the university in the agriculture college and he sent me to Ohio State. I came here, finished PhD and uh, rest is really something very uh, lucky, fortunate. Last year, 2019, I was the one who received the Japan prize, $500,000. And I had a dinner with the emperor and empress of Japan, my wife and myself. And I was thinking a journey from a village farm, one and a half acre to a dinner with the emperor of Japan. It had to be some good karma, <laughs> nothing else. And uh, then over the last two years, I should tell you this, that this village boy, got World Agriculture Prize, World Soil Prize, World Food Prize, Japan Prize, Errol Food Prize, all of them $920,000. And wow. I have given every penny to the Ohio State University. The idea is that they will make it a Ratanlal and Dodd professorship if it becomes a million dollars. So I'm thinking of putting 100,000 from my own pocket because I don't think any more award is left that I would get. So uh, I don't want to miss that opportunity. As far as the value is concerned, I have told everywhere I have gone, including to the emperor of Japan, the following thing, Kshati Jal Pavak Gagan Samira. Panch Tattva Adam Sharira. Kshati is soil, Jal Pavak Gagan Samira. And I have also mentioned Gurbani, that's my language. Pawan Guru, Pani Pita, Mata, Dharta, Mahat. No country. We have Air Quality Act. We have Water Quality Act, EPA. We do not have a Soil Quality Act. Our Gurbani linked all those three. And my last word, I have always told everybody, and that is Vasudevaya Kutambakam. World is one family. Surely if we treat everybody like our parents and cousins and sisters and brothers and uncles and aunts, and we share their burdens and joy, the world will be a very pleasant place. It's a pleasure and an honor to be Indian. Thank you for inviting me. Professor Lal, thank you so much. That is indeed an inspiration. Thank you for your wise words. Thank you. And we'll move uh, to our next speaker now, uh, Professor Jagadish Shet. Jagadish Shet is Charles H. Kelstar Chair in Marketing and uh, Goyajuta Business School in uh, Emory University. 
He was a member of the board of directors of the Academy of Marketing Science. A scion of marketing, Professor Shah has taken, Professor Seth has taken, sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, Professor Seth has taken marketing in new directions. For, his, for this marketing guru, emerging markets, brand marketing, design thinking, and international relations are all related. I can read his achievements for hours on end. He was awarded the Padma Bhushan in 2020 by the government of India. I would now like to invite Professor Seth to share his journey with us and how Indian culture has contributed to his success. Professor Seth, I request uh, you to speak. Uh, thank you, Professor Ramsani and your guests. Uh, thanks for organizing the event. Let me make a few comments before my journey itself, they are interrelated. I think the purpose of a nation is to unlock the potential of its people. And you can do it one of two ways. One of course is the entrepreneurship, innovation, but the other one is education. And I believe very strongly how education can unlock the potential of people as they've done for people who are here on the panel. If you take a grain of wheat, agricultural commodity, and make it into a loaf of bread, the value add is only about three to four times. If you take a rough diamond, an industrial commodity, and a good diamond cutter with polishing will get the brilliance out, which is about 15 to 20 times. But if you take a human being, nurture, mentor, educate, the value add is infinite. And that is the strength of India. This resonates very well with me personally because I'm a refugee from Burma. In 1938, I was born, I'm 82 years old. And actually 1940, Japan was conquering all of Asia, had come to Burma, conquered Burma on the way to India. And we became refugee. Very hardship, lost everything. My father has gone to start basically a trader community Rice trading was a very popular area. Lots of people from India had gone because British had divided the whole empire into two empires, East Asia to be run from Rangoon or Yangon and the West Asia from Kolkata, which was the old capital. So lots of Indians had gone and my father had gone. He was the entrepreneur in the family, not educated at all. He brought his two brothers and a cousin brother and we had a good livelihood, typical middle-class trading family, lost everything, came back to Kutch, where I come from. And of course, in Kutch, as you know, like in Rajasthan, it's a place where you're born to get out because there's nothing else you can do in that particular geography. I would be back in that little town in Kutch near Mundra. The name of the town is called Kandakra, running a family shop, not educated at all, probably making about 5,000 rupees a month and I'll be happy because none of us realizes our own potential. It is somebody else who discovers that, nurtures, invests in you, and then that's how you unlock the potential of people. I really began, by the way, hardships are very important in life because it builds your character and a strength with which you survive any adversity, any dislocations, any mobility that you may have. And we try to settle all over India, and ultimately we settle in Chennai. Of course, I had to learn English, which was a great mobility platform. And I came to the States in 1961. I was supposed to be a child accountant, <laughs> but it didn't happen. And I left him to come to my MBA in production management. But eventually I loved psychology. So my PhD is in behavioral sciences and my, my minor is social psychology. And I came into marketing by understanding psychology of consumers or customers, essentially. I wanted to mention this story because this is the future of India. Brilliant people out there, especially those who are not educated. And how do we give back to the nation so we unlock their potential and they can become as much a great diaspora within India and outside India. My value system has come from primarily my faith and my family. I'm a Jain. 
And Jane always believed that you can conquer yourself, all of the things that you do. So Jane is all about self uh, enlightenment, self control, and of course, self realization. You can unlock your own potential by hard work, belief in the system. And the three things we all teach in Jainism, as you know, as Professor M. Sami does it actually, it's very nice to meet her. It is basically, first one is absolute ahimsa or non-violence. No harm to any living human beings, respect for all life. I think it's a very important message that comes out of only countries like India. The Eastern culture believes very strongly that there's an ecological system. And in the ecological system, we play a role, but every other living organism also plays a role. Second point, of course, is unaccount one. That means there is no single perspective that is right or wrong. All perspectives are right, which immediately impacts logic because logic is truth and false, but there is no falsehood here. So how do you think about that alternative perspective? It basically it gives you tolerance for alternative perspectives, views, etc. And you learn quite a lot from each other. And the last one is aparigraha, uh, uh, that means non-possession, which is what we have done, my wife and myself. We have, have two foundations now. Uh, they've done an enormous amount of giving back to India, of course, but also giving back to society here. And we fund both academic programs with one foundation and the family foundation programs, all of the cultural programs in America primarily. And that's what I do. I've been on the boards of large companies like everybody else. Wipro has been a big one. I've been there, I've been a bunch of companies, but at this age now giving back. So my message to young people who are watching this program is that giving back doesn't begin at the end of your retirement. It begins as soon as you graduate. Somebody invested in you, your family did, community did. It's also your obligation to give back as we all do pretty much and that is the inner satisfaction, inner happiness we will achieve. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Professor Seth, uh, for your kind remarks. Uh, it is an inspiration, and uh, your wise words are um, uh, your leadership uh, for us is uh, inspirational. Uh, let's move. Uh, we, we look forward to learn from you more uh, during the panel discussion. Let's move now uh, to our next speaker, uh, Professor Srikant uh, Datar. Professor Dat Srikant Datar is George Baker Professor of Administration and Dean of the Faculty at Harvard Business School. For his incredible achievements, he was awarded the prestigious Padma Shri uh, this year, 2021. A chartered accountant, he holds two major degrees and a PhD from Stanford University. Professor Dathar connects the academia and the company boardrooms with incredible dexterity and ease. He is equally deft and ad advising, uh, at advising national governments. He has co-authored several books uh, on the science of management. He serves on the board of directors for many companies, notable among them being Novartis and T-Mobile. Uh, I would now like to request him to give us a glimpse of his journey from the University of Bombay to Harvard Business School and how his Indian roots helped him on this journey. Uh, Professor Dathar, I request you to speak. Thank you very much. And uh, let me start by saying what an honor it is to receive the Padma Award and uh, how humbling it is to be on this fantastic uh, panel with my uh, fellow awardees. Uh, thank you, Professor R.T. and Professor Vimsani for organizing this event and for selecting an important topic uh, for us to discuss and share our thoughts uh, later in this program. The role of the Indian value system in my career has manifested itself in several ways, I would say. Uh, but I would also say that most of these values, as uh, uh, those who have spoken before me have said, come from my family. And if I think back on what has been the root of that is the tremendous respect we had for our elders. Yeah. We looked upon them as role models. 
and learned many values from their behavior and life. They influenced us very deeply. Both my grandfathers were doctors. My maternal grandfather, Dr. C.G. Pandit, was a medical scientist and virologist and the founding director of the Indian Council of Medical Research. He received the Padma Shri in 1957 and the Padma Bhushan in 1964 for his contributions to Indian medical science and public health. His influence on my cousins and me was great because he taught us to wear success lightly. He was a towering figure in his field, but extraordinarily humble, generous, and kind. He showed us that one can be a better independent thinker, as Professor Seth was just mentioning, if you are more respectful of others' views than if you are not. These are important values. In my early career as a professor uh, at uh, Stanford and uh, later on at Harvard, listening to others' comments and criticisms of my research helped me improve my work substantially. In the many administrative roles I have held, I use his example to treat everyone else with great respect. My father was a freedom fighter in the independence movement. Mm -hmm greatly influenced by Mahatma Gandhi. And so we had a lot of Gandhian influence at home. He was the founder of what is now the Lal Bahadur Shastri Nautical and Engineering College. And from him, we learned the values of sacrifice, courage, and integrity. My father sacrificed a great deal during the independence struggle. And later in his life, so with the limited means that uh, my parents had, my brother and I could go to the best schools and colleges. And the value he instilled was to always think of causes, institutions, and family as more important than one's own success. From his teachings, I have always strived to put the institutions I have served first, whether, whether it is the universities where I have worked, or the companies on whose boards I have served. I also saw the great respect he enjoyed from his students. As a student, I've always had great reverence for my fantastic teachers in school and college in the spirit of Guru Shishya Parampara, of old Indian tradition. As a faculty member, I take great pride in my students' achievements. They are like family. Their success gives me tremendous joy. My mother was a magazine editor and social worker. And she taught us empathy. To yeah. think of others less fortunate than ourselves. And that a life well lived is measured not by what one does for oneself, but what one does for others. She believed in unity and diversity. And as Professor Atanlal said, Vasudeva Kutambakam, or the whole world is a family, particularly those who she could help and serve. To her, in the words of Rabindranath Tagore, service was joy. This influenced how I taught. I care deeply about my students' learning, particularly those who find the materials I teach difficult to understand. We learned very early about Atithi Devo Bhava, or guest is God. My brother and I remember numerous occasions when we would give up our bedrooms so guests could be more comfortable. Family and guests would come to our house unannounced. And it was very clear that we had to move from our room, even if we had an important exam the next day. In my own work, I try to meet with colleagues, staff, students, and visitors, even when they come to see me unannounced. My father was spiritual. He would teach us to do our dharma and not look for rewards because that was not in our hands. This provided a strong foundation of duty and responsibility. We did 
what we were expected to do, not only the things we loved to do. At that time, I know we would always, uh, uh, you know, rebel against it. But uh, I now know many years later how valuable it was that there were certain expectations that you had to fulfill. As I look back, these values shaped my career based on the choices I made, the decisions I took, and how I interacted with others. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be part of this event. I look forward to our discussion to come. Thank, thank you, Professor Dathar. What a splendid way to describe the path you have taken. Uh, true inspiration. Uh, I'm sure our audience will have plenty of questions for you uh, during the panel discussion. So thank you. And let's move to the next speaker. Our next speaker is SP, uh, Professor S.P. Kotari. Professor S.P. Kotari uh, is the global Gordon Y. Uh, Billard uh, Professor of Accounting and Finance and the former Deputy Dean uh, at the Sloan School of Management at MIT. He was the Chief Economist and Director of the Division of Economic and Risk Analysis at the US Securities and Exchange Commission. One can know his professional acumen and academic excellence from his amazing work uh, at the global, as the global head of equity research at Barclays Global Investors and as the head of the Department of Economics, Finance and Accounting at MIT. He is an expert on economic policy issues on India. He has received many awards, including the Padma Shri. I would now like to ask Professor Kotari to share his incredible journey from Bitspilani to MIT. Uh, Professor Kotari, I invite you to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> it's, it's truly a tough act to follow uh, this pantheon of speakers that have preceded me. Uh, it's, uh, it's inspiring, uh, it's humbling to listen to them and also uh, humbling to see how much they have achieved. So <clears throat> I wish I had gone first. That way I would not have felt all of these uh, a little bit of uh, <clears throat> inferiority complex, if you will. You know, and Jagdish Shet is probably as a psychologist is already analyzing me. You know, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> learning about the Padma Shri Award in January 2020 was truly a privilege an exhilarating moment and a most humbling experience. Uh, but it couldn't have been possible without many who selflessly and generously contributed to my journey. Yeah. To name a few, my parents, my siblings, extended family members and friends, and then world-renowned institutions in India and in the US and the professional colleagues here all have played an immense role in my success and I owe an enormous debt of gratitude to all of them. Truly, you know, it, sometimes you, you, you realize how lucky you have been. I pinch myself every day pretty much. I grew up in Gulbarga. I went to a local Marathi language school. My parents, yes, I was very fortunate. They were educated and they inculcated a love of learning. But, but truly, it's, it's an enormous amount of luck and what you make of the opportunities that you get. And as I said, I, it was small town, Gulbarga that I grew up. And guess where do I end up? In Pilani, which was even smaller town. You know? and, but really, that was a transformative moment. That really opened the window to the world for me. I, that, it was at that time I knew that, you know, what it is, what it means to be a small fish in a big pond. I always was in this small town, I was a big fish in a small pond, but really going to Pilani, that kind of set me on a path. And then I went to I am Ahmedabad and it was even more humbling over there. And then, then, then you know, I, I went to University of Iowa and some, some might ask, why did I end up in University of Iowa? I mean, and I'm very grateful and I had a great education. But the reason I applied to University of Iowa was they had the lowest application fee. 
So, so they ten dollars. I said, how long can I go? You know. So let me apply to University of Iowa, and, and I, lo and behold, I got in, and and they gave assistantship, whatever scholarship, tuition. So, so I went there, and then, then you know, it it, it has been uh, wonderful with with folks over there, and I went to University of Rochester, and then when MIT called, uh, I, I joined MIT. And and even more doors open. Uh, so the fact that so many uh, have helped me, I'm astounded by the generosity of so many uh, <clears throat> to me. And I cannot find words that would adequately express my gratefulness to all of them. But it really it reinforces my faith in humanity that we do work to uplift others. There are many who have done that to me, and I see that day in and day out. Yes, there might be some bad apples out there, but really, I have strong faith in humanity, and I see a lot of good that goes around, and people are trying to be helpful, to be constructive. Talking about the values, as an economist, I'm used to thinking about output resulting from labor, capital, and productivity. Productivity is key, but where does it come from? And this is the point that Jagdish Shet was alluding to earlier. Education is obviously a big part of that productivity, and other is culture. Culture seems to have both education and culture have a great impact on productivity. I was very fortunate that my family. And the small town in India, Gulbarga, where I grew up, soaked me in a culture that was central to my success. They provided encouragement, nurtured inquisitiveness, emphasized education, and most importantly, inculcated values to be a decent human being. I won't be standing in front of all of you without enjoying the luxury of that culture. And I am most grateful for that. One, I want to end with one, <clears throat> call it piece of advice or thinking aloud. I think taking risks is important. Mm. We underestimate the importance of taking risks. Right. As I look back on my career, how many different opportunities I had. If I had analyzed them to death. I probably would have said no to many of those opportunities. I didn't. I just said sometimes I think that other person must have thought about if they are offering me a job, they must have thought about. It. They must have done the homework. Let me take it. Yeah. You know that. So there is an element of risk taking that I encourage all of us to do. I'm not saying be reckless, but taking a little more risk taking that. Would go a long way. That is, as I said, this is more thinking aloud or advice, whichever way you want to take it. Uh, in closing, I want to thank the organizers for hosting this event and giving me an opportunity. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kotari. It is indeed our pleasure that we could hear your incredible story. Thank you. Uh, let's move to our next speaker, uh, Professor Subhash Kak. Uh, professor Subhash Kak uh, is Regents Professor of Computer Science at Oklahoma State University. Professor Kak weaves into quantum mechanics and computer systems as easily as he deducts the uh, myriads of patterns in archaeoastronomy and Vedic studies, helping us understand the esoteric systems of computers as well as the Vedas. He is a member of the Indian Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council. In 2019, the Government of India awarded him the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian award in India. I would now request Professor Kak uh, to share, share with us his journey from Kashmir to the USA and how the Indian value system provided him the foundation to succeed. Professor Kak, I invite you to speak. 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lavanya ji. Uh, delighted to be a part of this wonderful group. Um, I, uh, you know, it's hard to uh, find the beginning, uh, but uh, in as much as my path has been somewhat different, uh, somewhat unusual from that of most other people, uh, perhaps one thing that contributed to it was that my father who was a veterinarian uh, was transferred every two years from one small town to another in Jammu and Kashmir. So I went to many, many different schools, including one in Leh, Ladakh. And it was the local education. So it was not uh, English medium, etc. So I was introduced to whatever subjects that there are to be learned in Hindi. And I developed as I was growing up in conversations with the staff that who would come and drop in at our home and talk about uh, how they understood the world, uh, got an appreciation of uh, the Indian ways of talking about reality. And this is something that I've carried with me. And uh, after I'd done my PhD and came to the US, I remember distinctly, uh, it was early 80s, and I was uh, driving back home. And the question that popped up in my mind was that, OK, I'm doing all right as a uh, professor. Uh, but um, what does it all mean? What does my life story mean? So I thought uh, perhaps what I need to do is also to investigate what uh, those stories that I used to hear when I was a child, stories about you know consciousness and everything else, mm -hmm. I should investigate that uh, firsthand. And that's where um, very soon I realized that all the history books uh, that talked about uh, Indian sciences, uh, said that there was no science before the coming of the Greeks in India. And even Ashtadhyayi of Panani, mm. 500 BCE, uh, which uh, created a 4,000 rule grammar for Sanskrit, which has not yet been equal, which uh, scholars have called one of the most stupendous achievements of the human mind. He was, uh, according to historians, he didn't have any writing at that time and there was no science. So I thought that it didn't really make any sense. So I investigated different layers of Indian literature going all the way back from the Siddhantas to the Sutras, to the Brahmanas, to the Vedas, et cetera, over a period of years. And I discovered in astronomy and a lot of other stuff on which I was to publish you know, hundreds of articles and many books. And uh, what uh, it has given me an appreciation of was that first of all, Indian knowledge is a universal knowledge because the very heart of it is what is consciousness. And that's also yeah. the very heart of modern science, the frontier of computer science of physics or neurosciences, what is this phenomenon called consciousness. And this is really what was also the heart of ancient Indian science. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the Upanishads, uh, Mundak Upanishad says that there are two kinds of knowledge, apara and para. Apara are the sciences which can be written up in language and para is the science of, uh, of consciousness, of uh, the subjectivity that is associated with awareness. So all of this, I think, has uh, you know, made it a fantastic adventure for me because I've been sort of doing both things at the same time, you know, immersing myself in uh, either modern physics or quantum mechanics, because that also brings up the problem of the observer or the conscious uh, individual, mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as ancient Indian science. And uh, so it's been a great thing. So I believe it's this universality that I encountered very early on um, uh, about, uh, uh, about Indian knowledge you know, from the stories of the Chaparasis and everybody else, you know, grandmothers or aunts and uncles, um, which I wanted to question on my own, which I think has been a source of great strength to me. And I, as a, as a uh, recipe, if you will, of use to the general society, I think what we need to do uh, back in India is to step away from the colonial uh, approach to India, which is what we have adopted, and which I think has hurt us. Uh, for example, just to give you one uh, uh, instance, uh, back in India, we insist that a person should learn 
English before they can learn computer science or before they can learn programming. But why should that be the case? Programming is like mathematics uh, for, uh, for uh, IT to spread into all corners of the country. They've got to make programming accessible to everybody in our own languages. So with this, I stop. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kak. Uh, truly inspirational and profound. Uh, we would like to learn more from you uh, in the next session. Uh, thank you. Um, we will now move on to the next part of our session. Um, but before we move on, I would like to recognize a few of uh, the incredible scholars present among us here. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot recognize the achievements of each one of you individually, but I will just mention a few names here. Uh, present among us are uh, Professor uh, Vikas Sukatne, uh, Dean of Emory University School of Medicine, uh, Dr. Chintan Vaishnav, um, MIT uh, and Mission Director for Atal Innovation Mission at Niti Aayog, uh, and Professor uh, Paranjape, uh, Indian, uh, All India Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. Mm -hmm. I would like to inform uh, everyone uh, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are moving now to the second session. Uh, I would like to inform everyone that uh, uh, unfortunately, Professor K. Uh, Vijay Raghavan uh, will not be joining us today oh. as he had to attend emergency meetings uh, in the India uh, related to recent COVID uh, surge in India. Uh, we. However, have an equally illustrious scholar among us, uh, Professor Narendra Ahuja uh, from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he was instrumental in setting up the Indian Institute of Information Technology in Hyderabad. He is a world leader in the field of computer vision and artificial intelligence. He has co-authored numerous books uh, and his award list can run into several pages. He's also on the board of directors of several institutions in India. Given his expertise in both American and Indian institutions, uh, I would like to request uh, Professor Ahuja to join our panel and answer questions related to institution building in America, uh, mm -hmm. because our topic is related to uh, Indian institutions um, and academia. So we will now uh, open the floor for panel discussion. The topic is academic institutions for a new India, role of Indian American academics. For, for the participants, please send your questions to Bharatiyam questions in the chat box, and we will call out your name and you can ask your questions to the panelists. Please keep your questions very brief and to the point. While you are thinking about the questions here, uh, we have a few questions uh, that came in with the regist registrations. Uh, I will start asking these questions while uh, you are discussing your question, you're thinking your questions and uh, posting them. Yeah. The first question is for uh, Professor Subhash Kak. Um, uh, to cultivate core R&D capabilities, what is the role of Indian languages and the future of knowledge creation in Indian languages. Professor Kak, would you respond to that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I think uh, we really need to uh, make a turn as far as uh, policy back in India is concerned, where uh, we have prevented large uh, segments of the population, you know, maybe 90%, maybe five to 10% are very fluent uh, with English. And so they, they get into, um, all these subjects as well as uh, uh, rest of the people in the Anglophone world. But what about the rest of them? What about people in small villages and towns? And, and, I, I, and I see that there's at least one entrepreneur in India, uh, Sridhar Vembu of Zoho Corporation. What he has done, 
as head of a multinational company in Chennai. He's, first of all, he took his headquarters to a small village and he's telling mm. people that you don't have to have a computer science degree to do programming or to do work for us. Uh, because after all, what is uh, programming? It is knowing procedures, et cetera, and you can learn it uh, on your own. And of course, with effort and um, amongst people, he's had a postman, for example, join as a programmer. So I think we need to do some hard thinking and open up all of this uh, knowledge creation to people in all languages. Now, the reason why it may not have been done before was because we were afraid that if we didn't have something connecting us, namely English, uh, perhaps uh, you know the country would fall apart or break up or something. But I think we need to have faith in ourselves. I, and I think it, this doesn't mean that English should not be emphasized. Let us em emphasize English, but let not English be the uh, compulsory vehicle for learning of sciences. Learn English as well, but learn sciences in our own languages, excepting for those who are good at English and let them learn, it, learn the sciences in English. But for everybody else, let's open it up. And I think that will make a great change. Thank you, Professor Kak. Um, we have one more question for uh, Professor Ahuja. Uh, what could be a plan to improve the quality of PhD research at universities in India? Professor Ahuja, would you like to respond? I think you need to unmute. Yeah. Yes, instead of uh, giving generalities, I can give you a concrete example to serve both purposes at the same time, a paradigm and its testing. So what we did was to answer this question, we said, what is the purpose of PhD? One purpose of PhD is to continue the education from beyond bachelor's and master's to, to get people to think uh, more deeply about things. And when you think deeply about things, sometimes it is not the thing that matters, it is the approach to thinking, it's the approach to investigation. Mm. So what we did was we said, uh, we want uh, the students to investigate their areas, whether it's physics or electronics or whatever, computer science, mathematics. Um, but at the same time, uh, let the PhD, let the, let the uh, uh, their thinking be targeted onto a specific problem. In our case, we took major societal problems, not necessarily a particular you know, uh, problem in, in deep physics, for example, or deep electrical engineering, but think about a real problem in which brings in multiple disciplines together. Mm -hmm. So if you think about problems and go into the depth of it towards solving it, then you you think about interdisciplinary things. You, you bring people together because not one person can do it. You, can, you have to assimilate knowledge from different places. And if you're trying to solve a problem, you don't know whether it is, the solution is right or not until you test it out in, in, in real world. And one way of testing is to make it to see if this is really bought by the users, whether it really works. So if it works, then people adopt it, then it becomes an actual public activity. It could be commercial activity. So what we did was we took the research and the classroom knowledge and combination of it into solutions to real problems. And the final thing we tried to do was to um, develop this uh, uh, a tendency to do so, a societal sensitivity in people, institutionalize that effort. How do you bring out this increase, uh, amplify the sensitivity that all of us have to different degrees? And so if you can combine the samvedna with the knowledge, with the ability to formulate and research problems, and then not stop until you have seen its effects reach the, uh, reach the uh, people who are affected by the problem. So PhD education in India uh, can be enhanced in multiple ways as it should be by making people sensitive, students sensitive to problems, uh, give them the best uh, tools, best education in terms of the, the, the rules of uh, doing research, uh, standards, quality, and um, humility to accept criticism, etc. And then treat the classroom knowledge as a source 
of ideas that can then be focused onto the research problems, but all of them in the context of a bigger purpose, which all of the panelists have been saying, the Vasudev Kutumbakam or, or being part of society, one with it. So the PhD education is not a tunnel, rather it's a continuum, mm -hmm. which, is, which is very much part of society, not just your own pursuit. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahuja. Uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, it's a general question that came in with many registrations. Uh, but since uh, Professor Ahuja and uh, uh, Professor Kak had spoken, uh, I would request uh, others to respond to this question. Uh, why did each one of the panelists decide to become uh, professors? <laughs> I can begin that. <clears throat> oh, go ahead. Uh, in my case, it was accidental, clearly. Um, I always was curious about what motivates people. And it's an incident that may take 30 seconds or more because it's very important. I'm the only foreign student in a batch of 80 or so MBA, one year MBA program at Pittsburgh, only foreign student, not just Indian. And I listen to professors, we give huge respect, as you know, in India, write notes rather than question. My professors say that, by the way, in America, a typical housewife goes to the shopping center without a shopping list. And therefore, they are becoming impulse buyers. Now, somehow it didn't click well in my mind. So I rose my hand, always very diffident. But I said, does this mean that all illiterate societies are impulse buyers. Obviously it was false. So logic is more important than logical positivism, which is empirical evidence. And that stunned him. He was a top, top professor, an economist from Harvard, had taught at Chicago, was at Pittsburgh, which was a private university at that time. And he remembered me. He grew up in central Illinois. And when the time came, I wanted to bring my fiance to marry me in 1962 in Pittsburgh. I was earning only $287.50 as a stipend for a doctoral program. I needed more money, so I went to him. He had the money. My interest was in leadership under Bernard Bass, but this is what happened. And he said, I said, do you remember me? He said, of course I remember you. There was a confrontation. I wanted to walk out pretty much. You cannot put down your guru, essentially. And he became my best mentor. So just as Kothari mentioned, things happen there don't go more rational thinking. Everything is accidental. It happens for a purpose. So long as you have a positive attitude, guards are blessing you, environment is blessing you. If you take that attitude, things will happen. And that's my journey all my life. I've been an accidental scholar. I would have been a businessman clearly, go back and do something in manufacturing or whatever it is, but it's an incredible journey to go from a merchant class, first going to college, nobody went in my family to college, but my parents and my brothers were smarter than I am. I think comment that, you know, uh, Srikanth made is enormously important. Respect for your parents is very important because it gives you a different relationship than just a father, son, or father, mother, or whatever it is. I think it's a very important tradition. We still do, even though parents may be aging and almost in a wheelchair, we give them the respect by having them sit in front of any major event. We all respect and bow them. It is more for our enlightenment, not for them. And they appreciate. Today we have a serious problem in India with senior people as we have it in America. They're lonely. They feel like next generation has abandoned them. The social contract that was supposed to be between generations is breaking down with more modernization and contemporary living. And I think it is very important to have respect for the elders, no matter how well you have achieved. I think that message will be very important for the next generation of people. So it was accidental. I'm sorry to give you a long answer, but I'm very passionate about that new point. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Inspirational. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, we have a number of questions. Um, Mr. Nomesh Bolia, uh, would you ask your question? 
Now, Namesh Bolia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, the organizers, uh, for, uh, for inviting us all here. Great to see. I've met some of these people on the panel, the very distinguished panel. Thank you so much. Uh, it was great listening to you. My question essentially comes from the topic of the day as well as some of the things that the panelists have talked about. Uh, you know, quite a few of you have, uh, you know, in, sort of stressed on the Indian values and how you got it from, uh, from your family. Of course, I've also done the same. And my question really relates to, essentially comes from the dichotomy that any typical Indian faces when they grow up in India. You know, you have these values coming to you from the family, but the formal system, right, whether it's, it is the institutions or any other organs of the state, they don't really seem to be amplifying, forget amplifying, even supporting such values. So the question is, uh, you know, given that you know the US and given that you know India very deeply, uh, what do you think are the challenges before India in building institutions that leverage our civilizational as well as contemporary strength, right? To me, both are important. We can neither leave the contemporary part nor the civilizational part. And what can we as faculty members do in addressing these challenges? Uh, I'm a professor at IIT Delhi and that's why it's a very personal question as well. Thank you. Professor Kotari, would you take, take it? Well, here I go. Hi. You know. <laughs> <laughs> There, there is, I think there is <clears throat> a little bit of a central planning uh, permeates uh, in our thinking, and I would like a little less of that. Uh, but there are many, let, let, me, let me just say, for almost 40 years I have been here, okay, not even a single <coughs> educational program needed an approval from any body. MIT, you know, or Rochester also, or Iowa. Not even once did I have to consult anyone in assigning a grade to my students. Not even once. Even as a graduate student, I did not have. I had that freedom, okay? And so I can go on in terms of how much freedom there is or lack of or less regulated environment it is. And I think for, in India, the institutions to blossom, I think they, they, have to, they have to have more freedom and they have to have an incentive to build reputation. Mm. The institutions here, they work there, really, they work very hard to retain their reputation. And their alumni work hard to maintain because it is in their self-interest that their institution remains at the top of the heap. You, you also ask how much research. You, I came in 1982 to the US and if I had, somebody had asked what are the top 10 schools, I think that you know, people would have included uh, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Yale, um, Princeton, uh, Chicago, and and few others. Today, you ask, it is the same list, right? That's not true in corporations. You know, it Kodak yeah. was at the top of the heap. General Motors was at the heap. No, no longer. So, what is different? It is. It is. What is different is that these institutions they are continuously bringing entrepreneurs as assistant professors, giving them an opportunity and you succeed, they gave them some resources, you succeed, well and good. If not, well, too bad, it didn't work out and say goodbye. But that way they, they have been. And so there is a lot to learn from many of these experiences and I think India has enormous number of institutions. India has many talented folks. What is, we, we talk about PhD. I, I, to be honest, I don't think there are resources to have a lot of PhDs. We, we, we are at a stage where there is literacy we need. We need good undergrad programs, good master's programs, and there would be some PhD and, and whatever it is, but it is a resource intensive kind of uh, business. 
So I would give a lot more freedom and hold them, you know, if, if, if there is with freedom, you also have to have better enforcement, but those two are needed for Indian education to blossom. Uh, they will find their ways. Uh, right now, so many of the MBA programs, they knock on the doors of Western institutions, have collaboration. They're doing it on their own, right? They're doing it on their own and that will continue. So the incentive to excel is innate and it is everywhere here. And that, that will take place. What is holding back a lot of Indian system is, is enormous, just in ridiculous amount of regulation. And mm -hmm. so that's why, you know, you are going to regret asking me to answer, but as I said, <laughs> here I go, so. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Katari. Yeah, let uh, me just add one. Let me just add one point to the, the next uh, question is for you, actually. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll well, just add this something. Because I agree it. completely with uh, what uh, SP is saying, and the part that the that you were asking about the tradition versus uh, the modernization. This idea that uh, you know you want to have the freedom of thought, and that uh, you want to challenge uh, established orthodoxy and uh, you want to, uh, uh, you know, think in a very different way than what might have, uh, might have been uh, the traditions there. That balance, I think, uh, here is a little more towards, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving towards the newer kind of thinking entrepreneurs, as SP was saying. Um, so it's, it's not only the the freedom and from the the regulation it's this uh, how do you make sure that you encourage a lot of freedom of thought so that i think is a very re related point to us all right so the next question uh, is uh, from pramod varshni uh, also related to education and research uh, so pramod varshni would you ask your question please and uh, professor datar would uh, I'll respond to your question. Pramod Varshni? Yes, I'm coming. Yeah, no, thanks for taking the question and it's a distinguished panel and I know a few of the folks on the panel. Uh, I guess uh, what I have noticed is that at many of the top institutions, what the people do is incremental work. And I think Professor Ahuja talked about it like new way of thinking. So how can we move away from incremental work to fundamental and innovative work? That was my question. And uh, some of it has been discussed already. So let me just, uh, I think it's an important uh, uh, question and I think it goes to a little bit of what uh, I think SP and I were responding earlier because this is what we uh, uh, try to uh, seek. I think, uh, uh, you know, it's often the case that uh, when you go into, uh, uh, you know, fairly what we might call dominant domains, you tend to truncate the extremes. You tend to, uh, you know, the, the, whether it is the way the research progresses or uh, once it's a dominant design, you, uh, you uh, keep truncating the extremes. So I think the trick in trying to do this much more innovative uh, work is two things. One is how do you uh, encourage someone to challenge the paradigms? Because that's, uh, I think, critical. And then it has to be accompanied even here by resources that you, uh, you, you put behind it. So uh, I will give you an example of uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Michael Porter, when he challenged the way in which uh, strategy was being uh, taught. And he came up with a very different way of thinking about uh, 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 strategy. The then Dean John MacArthur provided so much. So that was one. So he, could, he was encouraged to challenge it, but then provided resources to uh, an individual who was willing to uh, challenge it. So you almost have to place these kinds of bets, if you will, as an institution, so that you're not continually truncating. You're trying to put resources where you think there might be some potential and a way to 
uh, spark uh, a different and a new kind of thinking. So I think it requires both those uh, skills. One is to actively encourage it inside the institution. And the second is to provide support. And you will get a lot of resistance to providing the support because people would prefer it to be distributed in a particular way. You're placing these bets. You may get it wrong. I think uh, SP was talking earlier about the idea of taking risk. And if you don't take that risk, you'll never get the outcomes that you are uh, describing. I, I would like to Thank add. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, decisions that have been taken in India in the 1990s uh, about information technology was to become the back office to the rest of the world. And that was done because uh, Indians were uh, somehow following the old paradigm established by the British when they established Fort St. George, East India Company. Indians are in the back room doing ledgers and the Britishers are taking decisions. So this is what we decided why, because we lack Atma Vishwas, we lack self-confidence. The Chinese or the Japanese using common sense, they said, we want to develop our own products. We want to develop our own IT products or every other products. And which is what, of course, has become a big uh, problem for the West. And I think what Indians, and this is not only at the national level, this also happens at the individual level. Before 47, when people were more connected to the tradition, we have giants of world science from India who came up from nowhere, you know, working in small closets like JC Bose or C.V. Raman and many others. But since then, great work, but not work of the same high quality. Why? Because you have to dream very big in order to achieve that innovative breakthrough. And we stopped dreaming. We were only trying to catch up, you know, uh, the socialism era. We want to catch up. We want to be um, self-sufficient. But you really want to be the best in the whole world. That's the only way to go to do innovative work, both at the personal level and at the larger level. Let me Thank add you. something. Thank uh, you, Professor. Uh, yes, go ahead, uh, uh, yeah. Professor Saint. I think, I think, Pramod, one of the things you may think about doing with or without institutional support, true scholars are always what I call deep generalists. They're very specialized, very narrow, and more and more with doctoral education, we make them super nano nano specialist and publish papers. But at the same time, you have to be broad based your knowledge because the best way you can grow a great breakthrough innovation is connecting the dots across disciplines that people never thought about it. Suddenly gets an aha. So I encourage my doctoral students, I encourage postdocs that I have to say, how do you become a deep generalist? It's a personal journey intentionally going out of your way from your field of specialization to study everything else. There's so vast knowledge. So if you are in one discipline, can you just think about knowing? And we have a Wikipedia today. We have all kinds of possibilities. The whole world of knowledge comes to your desktop now more so than ever before. I think that is where the knowledge really comes. It's a discontinuous function. Suddenly you think in a way, in a way that you had never thought before because you connect dots nobody else connected. You get an aha and the world gets an aha. And if you look at all of the best scientists, winners of Nobel prizes, whatever they are, they're actually more like a deep generalist. So that's my advice on a personal basis, not necessarily institutional support. You know? Professor Amsani, I, Thank I you also, very much. Okay. can I add one some, something okay. that is yes, particularly- yes please. yes, please, go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So in addition to what uh, Professor Shet just said, uh, you know, I think innovation can be divided into at least two categories. One is there are people who can sit in their room and study books and realize that what's commonplace knowledge in one discipline is the biggest problem in the other and vice yeah. versa. So sometimes trivialities of one area, common knowledge, people won't even look at, give it another look, can yeah. create revolutions in the other field. Uh, these things can happen because some people want to, you know, can look at these, study them in privacy. But I think more practical, especially from an Indian perspective, is that we have so many problems, okay? And problems are created by, by forces that are beyond us, but those problems are by demand, by necessity, 
require innovation. Otherwise, they won't exist. If there were trivial solutions, there won't be problems anymore. So you need innovation there. So if you connect, you know, like Pramod was saying, if you somehow uh, relate people's uh, uh, basic needs, basic quest to solving problems, either they will fail and would have learned something from it, or they would succeed and would definitely learn from them. And whatever they learn has to be innovative, simply yeah. because problems are not trivial. So you know, one way of achieving innovation, bottom up, you know, not from people who are born mm. to do that, uh, let them go and develop solutions and society will tell them it worked or not, but either way they would have learned perhaps their next attempt will be better. So try to solve problems which are naturally interdisciplinary and have them properly tested. And, and, and that's, that's definitely a way to innovate. Japanese, Chinese, same story. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, the next question I think is for uh, Professor Nandaji. Um, he has been a mentor to many of us. Uh, this question is about um, early career faculty. So uh, Prakash Jha, uh, would you ask your question? Namaste everyone. Uh, I am blessed to listen to such an illustrious, illustrious panel. Uh, thank you Bhartiyam team for organizing such a wonderful event. My question is, uh, what is the line of advice for early career faculties who are in dilemma or dichotomy, whether to go back to India or how to stay here? I think uh, this country needs you. And uh, to be staying here and working um, is no impediment. I think there are plenty of wonderful people in India. And uh, here, I think the more uh, you look at the challenges, the more people like you can uh, make their own contribution. Uh, ji, I didn't really want to say anything because I want to hear my colleagues, but uh, yes. I know that the time is running out. So I would probably say two things. One is that when you talk about younger people, what really assists them is your own example. And to help them, you can always be in a very close kind of relationship with them. You can work with them. I can give you one example that uh, I have, I was the PhD advisor for a person who is the foreign minister of Iran at the present time. Um, and uh, he was the one who became the ambassador uh, to the United Nations. And that is the only time that I went and uh, gave a talk to the General Assembly of the UN. The point simply I want to make is that he was the one who was not sure at that time what he wanted to do. But talking with him, being with him, and uh, um, you know, at least assisting him in terms of her, his own career, it helped. Uh, similarly, there are so many people who are now justices and chief justices in their own countries. And in this country also, in some states, I have had my own students who have been chief justices. And uh, these are the people who were the present at that time as students were simply struggling. So whether it's a, mm -hmm. a junior colleague of yours, and I have had many examples of those people that I've had the opportunity to mentor. And today they are deans of schools and they are at the present time pretty high places. And as uh, mentioned by my colleagues, you enjoy seeing that they blossom. We've got yeah. uh, uh, biggest corporations, uh, general councils, uh, at the present time, vice presidents. In one place, uh, one of my students became the prime minister of a small country. So it's always wonderful to see all these kind of things happen. I know that time is running out and I'm sorry I took even longer. I wanted to hear just my colleagues and not to say anything today. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'll say one more thing though. For Indian Americans here, one of my suggestions would be that uh, India has a new education policy. In new education policy, there are plenty of hiccups. They have got to uh, probably do much more work in order to make it function appropriately. But my request would be 
that Indian Americans in this country kindly look into the possibilities of uh, having relationship with universities in India. When I was the vice provost, I had 111 or 112, not MOUs, but agreements with countries all around, with universities all around the world. India was the most difficult for me yeah. to enter into at that time. Today, at least they are opening up. And so my request would be that we work with them. And I think you can probably assist in many ways, Indian universities under this new education policy. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from uh, Akshit uh, Singla, uh, and uh, he's asking, uh, Professor Akshit Singla, would you ask, you have a question for our panelists, right? For something? Yes, absolutely. Uh, just to clarify, I'm not a professor. Uh, so I'm a student at MIT. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for uh, hosting this uh, great panel, appreciate it. My question is regarding the statement like, uh, we need not wait until later, like rather to contribute to the society rather than just after graduation. So I wanted to ask the panelists, like what could be some good uh, channels to start with for beginners? You're saying <clears throat> channels for you to contribute Create. to others. Is that what it is or is it, you know? Channel to start contributing to the society and create impact. You, you, you my advice, you're not going to like my advice. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think at this stage, you ought to do really well in whatever field you are in. And that will give you an opportunity and platform to help many others. No, nobody would have paid attention to me if I had done in my early days I had not accepted. I would not be here. Jagdish Shade, I mean, we read his Howard Shade model in my MBA. Okay. Ask him what did he do? He worked hard to excel. Shrikan Datar, I have known, you know, for ages. And so the best thing you can do right now is to really do well and give some feedback to your colleagues and others as on a day to day basis. But if you say that I'm going to be helping the world today, you, you, your contribution is going to be rather limited. The Lavanya Chief is at 10 o'clock. So. <laughs> yes, uh, this is the last question. Uh, so we are uh, wrapping up for today. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for all your presentations. Oh, uh, Professor Makran Pranjfe uh, had his hand up, just, so uh, please. Thank you, thank you, Lavanderji. I'll just take 30 please. seconds. It's been yeah, very please. inspiring. I had to get up pretty early on a Sunday morning to listen yeah, to all of you. I know, I understand. And uh, I think your journeys are really, really inspiring. Many of you are associated with the University of Illinois where I did my master's and doctorate. But uh, I want to end on a slightly, uh, should I say, uh, negative note, though the negativity comes from a very positive uh, intention to help India. Actually, we are going through a tremendous governance crisis in this country when it comes to higher education. There is both over-regulation, as we've heard earlier from Professor S.P. and others, and there is absolutely no regulation in other uh, areas where privatization, uh, you know, without accountability, all over fake degrees, uh, you know, uh, predatory journals. So my point is, my real point is that in India, we must change uh, the culture, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, you know, of how our institutions are run, because the paradox of India is we have a tremendous competence deficit where uh, leadership is concerned, which is combined with a competence phobia. It's wonderful to parachute in experts from outside. If you come and live here as I have, as soon as I finish my PhD, I rush back to India. You know, I know the system inside out. I'm afraid we need root and branch reform. It's not enough to table new policies and try to manage narratives. 
I think that uh, our institutions are going through a tremendous crisis. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that all of you are very influential people. We should have further conversations. And uh, there are many things that need to be reformed if excellence has to be foregrounded in India. I'm not even going to talk about statutory uh, reservations, quotas, and so on and so forth. But the, but the rot has seeped <coughs> very deep into the system, you know? So we need political will, we need bureaucratic intent, and plus a change of culture. Thank you. That's what I want to say. Thank you for your Thank time. you. Thank and you, Professor Franz. Congratulations to all the awardees. They are my own uh, models in many respects. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Franz. Uh, with that, uh, we can wrap up. But I would uh, request uh, Professor Rati uh, to give the concluding remarks. Professor Rati. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Vamsani. I would, uh, <laughs> I think uh, the, the number of questions we got, I am absolutely sure that we could continue through the entire night and into tomorrow morning uh, <laughs> as far the Eastern time zone is concerned. But uh, <laughs> obviously I think this is not something to be done in a day. So I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, we're thinking that we definitely need many more such sessions where we could uh, think much more deeper and interact and figure out what really could be done. So first of all, I would uh, really like to express my deep gratitude to each one of our panelists, Professor Kothari, Professor Nanda, Professor Kak, Professor Datar, Professor Lal, Professor Seth, and Professor Ahuja. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you all taking the time and coming to this program and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, we definitely look forward to many more such events uh, where we'd like to invite you and, and uh, pick your brains and learn from your experiences. I would also like to thank each and every one of the attendees who have joined us in this session and really made it uh, a very interactive and a wonderful session. Uh, we will be reaching out to each one of you and I assure you that uh, in the future, we will be uh, having many more such programs where all your questions could be potentially answered, uh, especially uh, the younger audience among us. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, uh, I would like to thank um, the Bhartim team that has worked very hard to, to make this program a success. Uh, I, and I would like to uh, you know, also thank Professor uh, Vimsani and also Professor Sunil Kumar yeah. uh, who made, you know, help us uh, you know, move this program uh, to where it is today. Thank you very much and uh, good night to all.